Hey, welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake, also playing live in St. Paul over SPNN. And we will talk a little bit about what's going on in St. Paul School District. Of course, uh, the news that 15 million, they're going to be under budget. Also, teachers getting beat up again. And just what's going on over there. Uh, the school is in the school district is really in crisis mode, but you really couldn't tell it by the meetings at the St. Paul School Board, uh, School Board, what is it, the Committee of the Board uh, meeting. And that was filmed, and uh, Bob Zick's going to cover it a lot on his show, um, as he did last, last night. So you can go to bobzick.com and, and uh, see the video. <clears throat> the St. Paul School Board, uh, but boy, all this fighting over property and uh, who's getting what kids, and so now you really have all these government entities competing for the children, uh, and what's causing is a financial upheaval in school districts. So in order to attract students, places like Stillwater, uh, uh, Woodbury trying to build these behemoth schools, uh, millions of dollars uh, to build them, lying to the um, to to the parents, uh, lying to the community about what the referendum is going to be used for, and then changed. Uh, our education system is up in arms. It's not about needing more money. It's about really being properly administered and how to administer properly a, a public school. <clears throat> uh, if you had private schools, this wouldn't, and, and children had the choice of where to go. Parents had the choice for the children's of where to send them. You wouldn't have all this uh, chaotic, uh, activities going on, you certainly wouldn't have the discipline problem that you have uh, in the St. Paul schools right now where teachers are getting beat up and students don't feel safe and it's it's a bad, bad situation. Um, I, in that regard, I want to bring up, there's a press conference, uh, not a press conference, there's a meeting next week, um, March I believe it was March uh, 16th at 6 p.m. Uh, at the Stillwater Junior High, and this is a uh, gov uh, a required, legally required meeting because 50 people called to have this meeting, and is about combining the Stillwater and Matamide school districts. Well, Matamide sent out a press release uh, saying uh, how they feel about this. <laughs> so here's what it says. Um, we have received a number of phone calls and emails from district residents about next week's Minnesota Department of Education meeting at Stillwater. Here are some important facts. Matamide Public Schools and Stillwater Area Schools are not considering uh, combining or merging. Neither the districts nor the respective school boards brought, uh, boy, this, uh, some of this got cut off, uh, or brought or called this meeting. This meeting is a statutory requirement as a result of petition signed by uh, 50 uh, residents. Um, two districts was presented to the Minnesota Department of Education uh, to consolidate the two school districts. Uh, so it's required by the Minnesota Department of uh, Education Commission to have this public meeting and the purpose of the hearing is for comments and information needed to approve or reject the proposed consolidation. Uh, so after this meeting the, the commissioners a Department of Education has 60 days to make a decision as to whether, yeah, it's a good idea to merge these or not, and then the school boards have to vote on them. And of course, the school boards are going to vote no. Matamidi in this press release says they're going to vote no for the merger. 
And they're also saying here in their talks with the Stillwater School Board, they're, they're going to vote no also, so there will be no merger. But Stillwater, and the reason this is being brought together is because of the games that uh, Mark Anderson from Matamidi, the superintendent there, and uh, the superintendent from Stillwater, Pon uh, I think it's Pon Pontrelli, uh, and the mismanagement that's been going on. Uh, uh, Pontrelli, of course, a levy was passed, said that we weren't going to close down schools, we we're going to improve these schools. And so all these people went out, fought for the levy, and now they're closing down the schools, uh, the neighborhood schools. And so the people are outraged, and it looks to me like there will be a wholesale revitalizing uh, uh, of the school board. Uh, there may be two people that will be reelected, but um, some of these people that have voted for these schools to close will probably pay a heavy price. So they say it's in the name of uh, financial efficiency and saving money, uh, but um, there, there's a certain point when you know things cost money and you want to do them a certain way because the benefit of doing that way far out the higher cost of not doing it that way. <laughs> so. Um, a lot of uh, problems there. Now, what, what's happened in, you know, Montemita is being heavily taxed now because of, of open enrollment and they don't receive, that school district doesn't receive all the, they get the money, the state money from the kid moving there, but they don't get the, but the people in Montemita have to be uh, assessed for the extra cost of of having these students be in Matamidi. <clears throat> and so you have all these school districts now, what they're doing is they're trying to get students that are, don't live in their school district to come so they have more money. And so St. Paul is now talking about building another junior high school in the Northeast uh, quadrant there. And that's going to cost a lot of money, and so a bunch, a whole bunch of schools are going to be closed down uh, in order to funnel kids into that jun junior high. Uh, but the problem is in St. Paul, they have promoted, and the administration has said we're going to get more students to raise money so that we can run our school district. Well, what's happened is because of what's going on in Como High School and how teachers are being treated. Uh, with senior teachers are being fired just because basically of their age and the little scam that goes on to get rid of them and then also uh, because teachers are getting beat up parents are leaving the school district and and what's going to happen in Stillwater now is parents are going to leave the school districts they're going to go and find private schools or other places to go uh, where they think their kids can be safe and where they're not going to be abused by the system and lied to uh, by the system uh, there. And so a lot of these school districts, government school districts, are now facing a money shortage, and at least St. Paul is, is because they haven't met the projected enrollments. And they haven't said what they, they haven't followed through with uh, what they said they were going to be able to do. And thus, when you set a budget based on what you think things are going to be and they don't turn out that way, uh, then you're, you lose money. Now, $15 million is a small percentage of the overall $700 million budget, but, you know, so 2% two, two or so, but it's still um, a problem. And typically what they'll do is they'll probably go to the state asking for money to square away their situation. Uh, and so there's just no responsibility. And, uh, and they haven't been able to fulfill their, educate, their promises, their education promises that they said they've been able to do or said they would do. Uh, <clears throat> So now even the school board is seeing the school board meetings and hearing what they've been talking about, you know, and they got four new school board members and they're going to change and get things done. Well, now even they are, 
you know, it sounds to me like they're backtracking and buying into the administrative uh, lies and concerns um, and saying we got to do this thing, got to do the schools the same way. Here's the, here's the big thing about St. Paul schools. They treat, they're proposing and they're saying they're treating every student the same. So every third grader in the St. Paul schools at the same day has the same assignment. And so if that child would leave one day and go to the, another school in St. Paul the next day, they would, wouldn't miss a step in the assignments. And I just find that abhorrent. Education, you, you, you teach a child according to their ability. And if you're teaching every child the same thing, the same way, the child is not growing. Uh, m many of them aren't grow. Many of them aren't being challenged. And that's not education. You, 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 you have a managed control and let the child go. Okay, you're letting them go. You're letting them learn, but you're also managing it. Okay, so those that can handle more, let them handle more. Those that have to handle less and take a little more time to move along, you do that. Uh, but every child being treated the same. Look, socialism doesn't work. It doesn't work for education. It doesn't work for any aspect of life. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's going to be a failure. And it already has proven itself out to be a failure. Okay, so anyway, uh, March 16th, Stillwater Junior High, public hearing on the issue of uh, merging the Stillwater and Matamidi School District. So if you want to go to that, be there. All right, so uh, another issue that's come up is, um, I'm going to let you know there's going to be paperwork filed for an, uh, Minnesota Supreme Court on voter registration. Minnesota Constitution says voters have to be eligible before they vote. And when you have 500,000 same-day registration, the, there's no way the state can determine whether all these voters are eligible. But what's happening is they're getting to vote whether they're eligible or not. And what they found out, as many as 40,000 people uh, depending on the year, 7,000 to 40,000 people have been shown to be ineligible. They can't track down who these voters are, but they got to vote. And so the lawsuit is to get away so that they can determine every voter will be eligible to vote. And what's also interesting to find out is in these states where you do have voter ID, going on is that there are a lot more dem less a lot less democratic votes uh, taking place and um, why I don't know um, so for some reason this year Democrat voters are way down I don't know whether they turned to the Republican Party and are voted for Trump but you know we're gonna see uh, what that's about but having uh, ID, being able to verify uh, who's voting uh, is, is important. I mean, that's our Constitution. That's just what it says. You know, and so we have this whole attitude of, that's going on in our governmental system uh, where they've turned things upside down, where our Constitution isn't the foundation of law, it's the people in power is the foundation of law. The people are the representatives. Uh, the people are the workers for the government. They're the ones get to do what they want to do and have very little accountability. So that's why these lawsuits on same-day registration voting, to make sure our Minnesota Constitution is upheld, that these people are official voters. Well, here's another area that's come and this was a press release that came out today uh, from Eric Cardle's law firm. 
Uh, he's representing the Bryant Avenue Baptist Church. And that's in South Minneapolis, uh, 5601 Bryant Avenue South. And what they are doing is they're appealing a special assessment of $31,191 to the Hennepin County District Court. The appeal raises a constitutional issue of statewide importance, and the appeal is whether the Minnesota Constitution, Article 10, Section 1, exempts churches from special assessments. Okay, and it, it, it's amazing. I mean, you read it, it's, it's, it's clear. And uh, we'll, we'll read it to you once I uh, find it here. Um, but uh, a special assessment is a real estate tax, okay, which generally applies to a specific municipal area. You know, like you, you get your, your roads, okay? Your roads in front of your house get done, you get a special assessment. And that is all constitutional that it, that, uh, that happens. Uh, but there are also statute requirements that says how much you can get uh, assessed against your property. And what, um, and they can't go beyond a certain amount. And of course, Diana Longrie, uh, former mayor of Maplewood, has been successfully suing Maplewood and other cities uh, on behalf of her clients because the cities haven't been following the laws and been overcharging on these assessments uh, than what they should be charging. And, <clears throat> well, here, in the Minnesota Constitution, it says that ah, you, you can't do property taxes for houses of worship, uh, churches, uh, government organizations, um, you know, various places. So they're coming in, and let me let me find this right here. Okay, here it is. Okay. <clears throat> um, the legislature may by law define or limit the property exempt under this section other than churches, houses of worship, and property solely used for educational purposes by academies, colleges, universities, and seminaries of learning. So it specifically, our Constitution specifically says, uh, well, here's section one, the, the power of taxation shall never be surrendered, suspended, or contracted away. Taxes shall be uniform upon the same class of subjects and shall be levied and collected for public purposes. But public burying grounds, public schoolhouses, public hospitals, academies, colleges, universities, and all seminaries of learning, all churches, church property, and houses of worship, institutions of purely public charity and public property used exclusively for any public purpose shall be exempt from taxation except as provided in this section and there may be exempted from taxation personal property not exceeding in the, va the value of 200 for each household individual or head of family and household goods farm and machineries as the legislature may be determined provided that the legislature may authorize municipal corporations to levy and collect assessments for local improvements on property benefited thereby without regard to cash valuations. Okay, so it says local municipalities like the city of Minneapolis and like the uh, city of Maplewood, any city, they can levy, okay? Um, so churches can't be, can't be taxed, okay? property taxed wise and 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 then here it's talking about assessments and it says a legislature may by law define or limit property exempt under this section other than churches so they are left out but the city of Minneapolis once this uh, church gave notice you know they found out hey we're being assessed they went in and appealed that assessment city of Minneapolis said hey too bad you know, we're doing it anyway, and we're still going to assess you, and uh, we'll see what happens. Well, now they, they, this church is forced, being forced to sue. And this is the outrageousness 
of our government. They know they can't do a special assessment on a church. It's right there, plain language. You can't do special assessment on a church property, yet the city of Minneapolis is doing it. Now, why is the city of Minneapolis doing it? Who knows? I think one of the reasons they, they're doing it is because they don't like the law. They don't like the Constitution. And they want the legislature to go in and try to change this so that they can special assess any piece of property uh, that they want. Uh, so, um, who knows uh, why, why they're really doing this, but they shouldn't be doing it. And that's just a problem with our, a lot of our governmental leaders. They're doing something that they shouldn't be doing just because they can. And they say, go and challenge it, you know. Uh, so anyway, Eric Cardo is working on behalf of uh, Bryant Avenue Baptist Church, and that constitutional challenge is uh, being planned and uh, contested, and we'll see what happens in, in that down the road. All right. Um, I'm going to give you an update. Oh, just heard... Uh, Supreme Court Justice Dietzen, Christopher Dietzen, he's leaving the Minnesota Supreme Court August 31st. Why is he leaving August 31st? Well, let's understand some of the dynamics of the Minnesota Supreme Court right now. Right now, basically, as far as conservative versus liberal goes, uh, it's for, um, I, I wouldn't say conservative, I would say four Republican appointed judges versus three Democrat appointed judges, uh, all of them appointed by uh, Dayton uh, right now, and all the other ones I think have been appointed by uh, plenty uh, that are there on the court right now. Um, Dietzen is up for election. Okay, his post is up for election. He's saying, I'm going to resign August 31st, which creates a vacancy for about, you know, four months in the Supreme Court. That gives an opening for Governor Dayton to appoint a Supreme Court justice rather than have an election. All Dietzen has to say, he's only 69, he gets to go to 70 and a half before he has to resign which is unconstitutional, age discrimination. Um, and by the way, Eric Cardle would, Greg Wurzel would challenge that uh, for free, uh, pay, him, pay him a dollar. They, I, my understanding is they would defend uh, somebody running for judge that's over 70 uh, as a, an age restriction uh, that shouldn't be there. So. What Dietzen is doing is he doesn't want an open election for his seat. That's just really too, I mean, that's terrible. I, I mean, now what he's doing, he's giving this post, this Supreme Court seat, over to Mark Dayton to appoint somebody to that seat. And so here, he, here's a guy appointed by Governor Plenty at least he could have done is said, hey, you know, thanks for the appointment. Um, I'm not going to turn it over to a left-winging socialist uh, to make the decision of who's going to be there. I'm going to leave it to the people. He could have done that, but he didn't leave it to the people. And of course, in my mind, Christopher Dietzen got that black robe disease, got that uh, we're an elitist group of people. And I think the real reason that he's doing this is because of the political pressure inside the judiciary that, you know, he doesn't want to run for re-election, doesn't want to leave the open seat. That's part of the political pressure. But then he also probably wouldn't become a senior judge if he left it open for election. That's just the way our judicial political pressure works in, in, in our court system. You follow what the majority of the judges want, what the 
uh, attitude of the judiciary uh, is. And they want appointments versus election in the judiciary. And you pay a high price if you, if you don't uh, push and leave a position for an appointment versus an election. So he probably will not get um, senior judge status. He probably won't get to come in and uh, replace another justice or fill in for, for cases uh, when there's openings, which a lot of these retired judges like to do, to bring in a little extra cash, or I'm not doing anything this week, I'll come and help out in the courtroom. Uh, but what, we're, what I'm understanding and why, what I'm hearing in the courts is that if you leave a spot open for an election when you retire, you don't get these senior judicial appointments. They won't give them to them. They won't give you these side jobs out there. So uh, it, it's re really it's a stab in the back to the Republican Party, which is for judicial elections. And uh, it's a stab in the back for democracy and representative government uh, by him stepping down. It's just too bad. Okay. Um, we've talked in the past about the Sandra Grazzini Rocky case and and the, the updates I gave in, the, in in last week is is very um, about Grazzini Rocky of course she had a million dollar bail set that got reduced to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars and then what happened is after being in jail for about four months or she was sent over to the workhouse for some reason Ramsey County workhouse because they didn't have a facility for her um, all of a sudden a couple weeks ago she got released. Uh, now there was a motion before the court and that court, the motion basically said it's cruel and unusual punishment. Nobody gets a million dollar bail for what the crime she's being charged with which is deprivation of parental rights. Uh, of course she's the parent and, uh, um, or, and in this case deprivation of custodial rights because she did not have custody of her children. Neither parent had custody of the children. So she served more time than if she would have actually been found guilty uh, of this. And, and the bail was excessive. And they went back in and did a challenge. And the judge who assigned her the million dollar, uh, $750,000 bail said, uh, all right, you can go on your own recognizance. How does that happen? How can somebody be so dangerous and such a flight risk that all of a sudden their bell just goes away? It's just unbelievable. And this is uh, Karen Asbaugh is the judge uh, that dismissed the charges, um, or didn't dismiss the charges, but uh, reduced the, the bell and let her go on her own recognizance. Uh, but Karen Asbaugh is also doing the uh, uh, hearing the trial against D.V. Evavold and the Dollins who had the two girls that had run away uh, at, their, at their ranch. And, you know, one of the processes, when you're being charged with something, you get to go to the court and you get to plead guilty or not guilty. But you have a right to see the evidence against you before you do that plea. And here, uh, Dee Dee Evervold had been charged. And so she has a hearing on uh, Tuesday, I believe it was. It could have been Monday. But she goes there and um, she says, hey. And she's been trying to get the information from the prosecutor. And the prosecutor's got to give this information before they have this omnibus hearing. Okay, well, the prosecutor comes in, doesn't have the evidence. Dee Dee's been asking. She even instead of, not instead, but also asking for the evidence against her, um, said, and asked the prosecutor, which that's who has it, that's who's to give it to her. And the prosecutor wasn't doing that. 
they also then went and did a data practice. She went and did a data practice request, tried to get it that way. And then the county comes, well, you got to pay all this money for this data practice request. Well, no, this information was free or just the cost of the desk. You know, a $5 cost, but the county was coming back saying, oh, we want, we want 210 bucks. You know, but, but Dee Dee's going, no, you got to give me this information anyway. Give it to me. You're not giving it to me. So I started this other process to see if I can get it that way. And so they're before Judge Karen Aspaugh in this case. And so what she ended up doing is she just rescheduled the hearing to have another discovery review hearing to see if she got all the, if Dee Dee got all the information. Now, Dee Dee did a motion to dismiss for, uh, not timely getting her information while well, the judge just postponed it uh, down the road. And um, uh, so that will be coming up uh, somewhere around May 12th. Uh, but the trial on this case isn't set till September 25th. So what, what's happening is in these type of cases, this is another way of punishing somebody. Uh, keeping them coming back over and over and over and having to spend their time coming back. And like Sandra Grazzini Rucky, keeping her in jail without bail um, is a punishment uh, rather than, no, you're innocent. No, we're going to punish you anyway, uh, whether you're guilty or not. So you have this punishment rather than preventing her as a flight risk. So it's just an overreaction. Again, it's these governmental uh, employees doing things because they can, even though they know it's violating the Constitution, uh, even though they know they're not doing the right way procedurally in, in the process. And so my understanding, Dee Dee Evervold, uh, who drove the kids to this ranch um, is the charge and and she had, my understanding is she admits that and the judge denied the you know motion to dismiss the charges for lack of any evidence against her and lack of the prosecutor giving her anything not you know wasn't likely to happen but the should have happened okay so you know, that's kind of the update on that case. All 2020 uh, news show is in town tomorrow, filming outside the Ramsey County uh, workhouse where Sandra Grazzini Rucky uh, was held all this time. And so they're, they're going to cover this. That, that show is going to be May 8th, is my understanding. Uh, that should be a Friday at 9 o'clock our time. So... Uh, fascinating stuff again um, so you know this this goes to a, a, an interesting point um, as far as prosecutors go as far as their behavior prosecutors have what's called prosecutorial discretion and so when you have Hillary Clinton doing all May 8th is a Sunday. huh May 8th is a Sunday. okay Maybe it's a Sunday show. I, I didn't think it was. I thought it was a Friday night. Um, I don't know the date. We'll figure that out. Um, with Hillary Clinton having all these charges, the, the chief head prosecutor for the federal government, Loretta Lynch, uh, doesn't have to prosecute and says basically probably won't prosecute. Uh, and she doesn't have to because they have discretion. And the only way to deal with the prosecutor is to get them fired or in some places like the county prosecutors, the head county attorney, you can not reelect them. Uh, other than that, prosecutor decides they have full discretion of who to prosecute and who not to prosecute. And so uh, in order to so there's no way to punish a prosecutor except through the election process or the head, head county attorney uh, there and, and not reelect them. Uh, very, uh, very hard thing to do. So that's, uh, that's the update on the Grazzini-Rucky case. 
and uh, still um, the girls are not seeing the father as has been described. Um, the, the relationship is still pretty rocky. And of course the girls went to a re-education camp, you know, something that we have fought against. That's a communist type of thing. Um, so there's a, just a whole lot of problems and, and the judicial branch has a whole lot of fault in this process, especially David Judge David Knutson. And we'll see if 2020 highlights the issue of how bad this judge's behavior was in this process. He's not an innocent party in this thing at all. All right, um, another uh, piece of news that came out was um, lawmakers in Kansas are seeking to impeach judges. Uh, I wish Minnesota lawmakers here would seek to impeach judges, but there's been a a history of judges going beyond their bounds in Kansas, especially relating to school district funding. So according to this article, Republican lawmakers in Kansas, weary of conflicts with judiciary that has been pu pushing for more school spending are beginning to act on a measure to expand the legal grounds for impeaching judges. The move is part of an intensified effort in red states to reshape courts still dominated by moderate judges from early administrations. The committee in the GOP-controlled Senate plans to vote Tuesday on a bill that would make attempting to usurp the power of the legislature or the executive branch grants for impeachment. Uh, impeachment has been a little-used tool to challenge judges who strike down new legislation, said Republican Dennis Pyle, the sponsor of the measure. Maybe it needs to be oiled up a little bit or sharpened a little bit. Since Governor Brownback and GOP supermajorities won control in the State House in 2010, conservatives have passed a stream of bills cutting income taxes and spending, expanding gun rights, and restricting abortion. Um, what's happened in the past is the states have the right to spend money, but the Kansas Constitution says you need to adequately fund education. Well, the Supreme Court has ruled that the state in Kansas has an adequately funded education. Therefore, they have forced the legislature to spend more money on education. And, of course, that's the Supreme Court appropriating money, and they have no power to do that. And so this is all this history coming together, uh, and Kansas is starting to fight back against these judges who usurp authority that they don't have. Adequately funding education is determined by the legislature by based on how much they actually fund it. If they fund a certain amount, then that's the adequate amount. Uh, so it's, uh, uh, I, I, you know, I'm glad they're doing it. I wish Minnesota would look at our judiciary and start using the power of impeachment that they have for judges who have violated people's constitutional rights. And we have a number of cases out there and told about many on this show in the past. And um, they just seem to have a deaf ear down there on, on that issue. Uh, you know, I've talked about Maplewood Community Center quite a bit. And uh, I want to tie in a couple of things that are, that are going on here. Of course, Maplewood Community Center losing money left and right. Now, we had our caucuses last week in, in, in Minnesota. So if you went to your precinct caucus, you got to vote for president, and you got to vote to help change the party platform if you thought it needed to be changed. Uh, and that's part of the process. What most people don't understand is if you don't go, if you go to your caucus and you vote, your vote doesn't count. It, it does a little more this year, but you need to be elected delegate for your vote to really count, okay? Now the Republican Party has set up this year in certain states 
that it's all proportional. De delegates at the national convention are all proportionately assigned based on how people voted in the state. So in, in Minnesota, Rubio won, uh, Cruz was second, Trump was third, I think that was the order. The, the delegates will be apportioned proportionately amongst those, those candidates. And the delegate that gets elected to the national convention has to vote. They will be assigned a person to vote for it. They have to vote for them on the first ballot. On the second ballot, all bets are off. There is no, you have to vote for whoever. So the person going to national gets elected by delegates along the process. So for example, you go to your precinct caucus, if you didn't get elected delegate, you, you don't get a chance, an opportunity to support your candidate anymore. It's done. Your vote that happened that day in Minnesota, you're done. Now it's going to be up to who gets to the national convention as to whether your vote will count for who you wanted it to count for. So you should have gotten your delegates elected, the people that you knew who they were going to vote for, for the candidate that you wanted. You needed to have your delegates in at the precinct level to get your candidate voted for at the next level. So at the next level, if you got voted delegate at the precinct level, you go to the next level, which is the House BPOU, Basic Political Organization Unit. When you go there, then you're selecting a whole nother group of delegates. And so you need to find out who you want to have as president, and you need to elect your people to be delegates to the next level. And that next level gets you to the U.S. House District level and then the state level at the same time. So if you get ele elected delegate at the BPOU, you get to go to the district and the state. And then at the district level, a certain number of delegates are going to be elected to the national, and at the state level, a certain number of delegates are going to be elected to the national. And so what ends up is those that get to the national level, they're going to have their biases. They're going to have the people that they want to see president. They're going to have, uh, they're going to have gone through the process to try to get elected, and once that first ballot is done and we don't have a, a pre, uh, an individual, a candidate who's got the majority vote, uh, over 50% majority, I think it's 60% at the national level that you need. Um, anyway, some 1,247 delegates, something like that. If there is not uh, that number of delegates voting for that person, they go to another ballot. Well, how, how do you change the number if everybody has to vote for the same person every time? In other words, people get to change their mind. It's a representative government. You elect representatives. Those representatives get to change their mind. All right, so you want to know who the person is going to be voting for. Okay, that's the caucus process. That's the representative government process. So even though somebody comes in there with the majority, the real ballot is going to be the second ballot. That's going to give a real good idea as to who's going to be uh, uh, the president uh, elect for the Republican Party or the Democrat Party. Okay, I'm bringing this in in the caucus because I want to tie Maplewood Community Center, North Heights Lutheran Church, who just went out of business, and the caucuses together. Okay, so it's not about just voting, but it's also about showing up and when to vote and who you elect. So North Heights Community Center, or <laughs> North Heights Community Center, North Heights Lutheran Church just went out of business. It used to be a big church. They just closed their doors. Okay, and, and the reason is the, the church went from a large membership down to a small membership, and that was because of a pastor that came in there. It happened to be a lady pastor, and the people did not like her, so they left. Now, the question got asked, how did the lady pastor get there? 
The lady pastor got there in this case, Pastor uh, B-A-K Back, or Bach, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, she got there because a small number of people showed up for the quarterly meeting or the annual meeting where she got elected in. Understand this, if you read the articles in the paper, they're saying two-thirds of the church left. How does two-thirds of the church not constitute a majority? They could have had whoever they wanted in there as a pastor. They could have gotten rid of this pastor that was there. The issue is they didn't follow and or understand their constitution, and they didn't show up at the meetings where a small group of people did show up and controlled the church because the majority of the church didn't show up. Okay, And that's the same thing that ha happens in caucuses. Okay, it, It's about who shows up and who votes. So instead, there's another way of voting. And the, and the mass of people, and my understanding is over a thousand people, they left and moved to another church. If that thousand people would have showed up at the quarterly meetings, or whenever they had their, their meetings, and, and voted, they could have still been at their church. They would have had a different pastor, different staff, different everything, their budget would have been fine, but they didn't show up. And instead of, ah, we got a document here that navigates through this, and since we're in the majority, we can, we can get our way, you know, they, they, let, they let other people make that decision. So that's the same thing with the caucuses. The people that go, went to vote on caucus night got their vote in, but then they, when they left and didn't get elected delegate, they said, I'm going to leave it up to somebody else, even though they're going to vote for not who I want, for someone I don't want to have in as president or be endorsed by our party doesn't make sense, but that's because they don't know the process. I just told you the process. So in the reality, you got to be engaged, and you got to follow through. And it doesn't take that much time. It really doesn't. And, and I guess I'm saying this all in the fact that, you know, this is kind of the inside secrets. They're, they're really not secret, but you do have to spend time to learn about it and then believe it and then act on it. Uh, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that don't know this is how it works uh, and never been engaged in the process and are just letting other people make decisions for them. And the, the net effect is you get ruled by somebody you don't want to be ruled by is, is what's happening. And it, it's just too bad. So... The, the, the piece I want to tie in with North Heights Lutheran Church and the Maplewood Community Center is Maplewood Community Center is losing money. Yet year after year, a matter of fact, they've never made money. Year after year, 20 years, they've lost money. And this last year, another big time loss of money. You know, somewhere amount of a million and a quarter uh, dollars. North Heights Lutheran loses money, they shut down. Maplewood Community Center loses money. Hey, we got the guns. We're going to come and take your money. We're going to raise your property taxes. You don't pay us, we're going to take your uh, house away from you so that we can have a community center for just some people, uh, a, a few number of people, um, that belong to this uh, membership here and they get to use it, you don't because they pay and we're going to take money from you and your house uh, so that this community center continues to operate. Okay. And I go down to the Maplewood uh, City Council and I says, hey guys, you're not a church. Okay. This is not something you should be doing. This is a socialist program. It's going to lose money. You have no incentive to make money. And uh, you're just costing the taxpayers millions of dollars. And, and my calculations, you know, at least $10 million plus interest 
over these years, which has become around $20 million that the taxpayers have spent and got nothing out of it, nothing. And that could have actually, we could have gotten something in Maplewood, maybe better streets for all of Maplewood for that matter, okay? But they still exist. The Maplewood Community Center is still going on. North Heights, you close the doors. It wasn't working, you close the doors. Maplewood Community Center should close the doors, sell the place. North Heights will be sold to another church, another organization, um, <clears throat> or the old people can maybe that left may come back in and buy the place, you know, whatever, but you're going to have a real market value there. Maplewood Community Center, you have a fake market value and a failed system, and it's not going to work. All right. We're going to close with a video uh, by uh, Judge, I'm going to mess up the name, uh, Napol Napoliano? Napolitano. Napolitano. Getting yelled out from the control room. Uh, I wanted to add a few more syllables in there. Uh, it's just, I'd like it sound better. Um, but he really describes what's going on in our country now. He's asking questions. But to me, these what if questions are really, this is what's happening. And folks, we're losing our nation. Minnesota Supreme Court, that's going to be lost. Your, your liberties are going to go downhill. We're going to, Minnesota socialist a lot anyway. It's really going to go downhill uh, here soon once the Supreme Court now becomes all liberal. Uh, and there it will be one seat open for election against uh, Natalie Hudson because she was appointed. That will be a seat open for election. Uh, we need to get a conservative in there to protect our liberties. Not a corporatist, not a big government Republican, but a conservative. And uh, <clears throat> that's, that's what we need to have. So we'll find out who's running. If you know of somebody who wants to run for the Supreme Court or any of the district courts or appellate courts, let me know. Okay, we're going to play some of this Napolitano video. Does the government work for us or do we work for the government? Tonight, what if the Constitution no longer applied? What if the whole purpose of the Constitution was to limit the government? What if Congress's enumerated powers in the Constitution no longer limited Congress, but were actually used as a justification to extend Congress's authority over every realm of human life? What if the president, meant to be an equal to Congress, has instead become a democratically elected, term-limited monarch? What if the president assumed that everything he did was legal just because he's the president? What if he could interrupt your regularly scheduled radio and TV programming for a special message from him? What if he could declare war on his own? What if he could read your emails and your texts without a search warrant? What if he could kill you without warning? What if Supreme Court justices no longer looked to the Constitution to determine the constitutionality of a law, but rather simply to what justices who preceded them thought about it? What if the rights and principles guaranteed in the Constitution have been so distorted in the past 200 years as to be unrecognizable by the founders? What if the 50 states were no longer sovereign entities, equals to each other, and parents of the federal government they voluntarily constituted? What if the states were mere provinces of a totally nationalized and fully centralized government? What if the Constitution was amended stealthily, not by constitutional amendments duly ratified by the states, but by the constant and persistent expansion of the federal government's role in our lives? What if the federal government decided if its own powers were proper and constitutional? What if the Constitution were no longer the supreme law of the land? What if you needed a license from the government to speak, to assemble, or to protest against the government? What if the government didn't like what you planned to say and so it didn't give you the license? What if the right to keep and bear arms only applied to the government? What if posse comitatus, the federal law that prohibits our military from occupying our streets, were no longer in effect? What if the government considered the military an adequate dispenser of domestic law enforcement? What if cops looked and acted like troops and you couldn't distinguish the military from the police? What if you were not secure in your person, in your papers, and in your property? What if federal agents could write their own search warrants in defiance of the Constitution? 
What if the government could decide when you were and were not entitled to a jury trial? What if the government could take your property whenever it wanted? What if the government could continue prosecuting you until it got the verdict it wanted? What if the government could force you to testify against yourself simply by labeling you a domestic terrorist? What if the government could torture you until you said what the government wanted to hear? What if people running for president actually supported torture? What if the government tortured your children to get to you? What if government judges and government lawyers intimidated juries into convicting the innocent? What if the government could send you to your death and your innocence meant nothing so long as the government's procedures were followed? What if America's prison population, the largest in the world, was a cruel and unusual way for a country to be free? What if half the prison population never harmed anyone but themselves? What if the people had no rights except those the government chose to let them have? What if the states had no rights except to do as the federal government? What if? I kind of think that may be the way it is <laughs> out there right now. Uh, good statements. Uh, you can go see those. Uh, just Google Judge Napolitano and um, that should come up. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. Sets on fire